right, welcome everyone to Charles Emerson, Color and Abstraction. Uh, please take a moment and make sure your cell phones are in silent mode. My name is Jenna, I'm the Education and Community Engagement Lead here at BIMA. And I'd like to start with a quote by Chief Seattle. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. And to acknowledge the land on which we are gathering, it is within the ancestral territory of the Suquapsh, people of clear salt water, Suquamish people. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquabsh live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's central Salish Sea, as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquabsh live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. And so today, I am I'm so thrilled and honored to moderate this conversation with Charles. There will be time for questions and answers afterward. And there's also going to be a nice reception out in the galleries after as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So Charles. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. We're looking at a Vermeer. And I'd love for you to share the story of the meaning of this painting in your life and work. Thank you. Um, this came sort of apparently a little bit late. I, I had, uh, I had um, gotten permission from Yale to be an artist in absentia as I got a Fulbright, Scott, Fulbright scholarship to go to Venice, Italy, where I was for two years. And before I left, well, actually, why I was there, my, my scholarship was to study uh, Byzantine art. It sounds strange to be in Venice, Italy, but there's a town called Ravenna that has four major, major buildings left over from the very late years of Byzantine art in perfect condition that are heartbreakingly beautiful. Out in the middle of nowhere, it's, you have to see those. Also, Torcello, a separate island, their first church is basically Byzantine. It has the most beautiful apps. You know, the round thing at the back, and um, there's a window in there. Have them turn off the lights. You know, every time you go to a church, they didn't have electric lights. So look at the way it was meant to be. And standing on top of this window is the Virgin Mary. What you're seeing is her standing on light in this beautiful space. And then in the back, as you leave, there's all these wonderful versions of hell that are going to keep you on the right track. <laughs> so it's the first church that they built. And a very few people ever go there. And if you have a lot of money to throw around, uh, very, there's a very famous restaurant right on the dock that cost a fortune and a half. It had, they have a little bar in Venice, but uh, this is a restaurant. <laughs> and it, now, this was 50, 50 years ago. Right? It was around 1960. Around 1960. Yeah. And will you, will you share with people your, your experience of discovering the view of Delft? Okay, now yeah. here on the view of Delft. So before I went home, I, I'm hunting for Rembrandts and Van Goghs. These are the things I'm really interested in. So I went into uh, The Hague, and there was nobody in there. It was in the middle of winter. It was a really rainy day outside. It was very cold. I looked down this very long highway, and there was a Rembrandt, one of those huge Rembrandts with all kinds of people not a night watch or anything very famous, but a beautiful painting. So I was there, and I walked down all by myself. I never saw another soul in there, except for the person who was taking tickets at the door. And I'm looking at the room, and I go, oh, God, this is so really beautiful. And then all of a sudden, I felt this tapping on the back of my shoulder. And I said, you know, 
So I sort of turned this way. Then it happened again, only more insistent. I turned around, and there was a view of Delft. I looked at it, and it was like somebody kicked me in the stomach. I, all my senses came up at the same time. It's called synesthesia, when they're all active. If, if you just have two or three, that's enough. <laughs> but this was just, I thought I was going crazy, or I was having a stroke or something. But this painting was magic. I'm looking at it. The sky is going this way. The water at the bottom is going this way. The people down in the corner, you could hear them <coughs> talking on the beach. It was just the most amazing, magical thing I have ever seen in my life. And it's considered by many people to be their famous, their favorite painting. It's certainly most everybody's favorite Vermeer. But um, it just changed my whole idea about art, what art could be and what art could do. Now, I would like to ask if anybody really has a good definition of what art is. <laughs> now, everybody, you know, there's all kinds of ideas. They had a, a big meeting in Paris shortly after the Second World War, all kinds of philosophers and people who knew a lot of things got together, like a panel discussion, and they're trying to figure out, what is art? Well, they came up with one sentence, which seems to happen uh, all, all the time for me. An additional reality is a characteristic of a work of art. Something more than just a picture. Something more that's not defined. It's how everything comes together, everything's right, everything's in harmony, couldn't be any better. I think that's a wonderful definition. And that is what I've tried for every, ever since the view of Delft. Um, after that, uh, when I went back to Venice Beach, uh, my friends, who are cool school people, or hard-edged people, here I am, this little old-fashioned painter <laughs> who's painting real things, who's in love with brush strokes and oils and mixing colors, and I can't give it up. You know, all my friends are doing all these wonderful things. James Terrell, Robert Irwin, you know, Kenneth Price, they're all pushing the boundaries in their particular fields. Robert Irwin is the most amazing person I ever met in my life. I mean, I just, he, he, he write books, he had book, he was uh, covered in the New Yorker by somebody who just looked at his work and wanted to write about it. And he gives us a new way of looking, an additional reality to everything. He doesn't, he was painting at the time I met him. Now you're gonna see a couple on the slides. Um, let's bring up, we got the Irwin right we now. Uh, can we have the one that has the yellow line in it? He was figuring out how to make a painting. How could he do something well? He had a show that um, he was in the military, and these are fairly realistic paintings, including a self-portrait of him in his uniform. And he, it all, all of a sudden, he realized it was at the top gallery in La Cienega in Los Angeles. And before it opened, he looked at it, and he said, oh my god, this is just, in his own words, this is just shit. It's awful. It's his really good friend, Craig Kaufman, who has the sharpest eye I've ever ran into, came in and said, you've got to be kidding, and then left. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it was bad, and he knew he had to find out a new kind of art for him. So he went out, and he spent several months in deserts just walking around. He figured, well, it's work, working for all kinds of people. It's working for me. 
and thinking of what art is, what art needs to be, what is, how to make it better, how to move on. We had one person in Los Angeles who was the main person who pulled everything together. His name was John Altoon, that you probably have never heard of. If you ever have a chance, we want to see someone who was many, many years ahead of everybody else. It's John Altoon, who was the most gregarious, open-hearted, friendly, wonderful person going. We were also blessed with Walter Hopps, who could see what, where art was going, what was going to happen. He just sort of knew. He put together a show with Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp had retired for many years, and he was doing nothing but playing chess. He talked him into having a show at Pasadena Art Museum, which at the time looked like a, a Chinese gift shop. You know, he turned it into one of the leading museums in the country. Also, he's the person who brought, um, who's the guy who does sandal, uh, Campbell soup cans? You all know him. That show was his first show, and it was at Walter Hopps Gallery in La Cienega, in the Hollywood area. We were so blessed to have people that really knew what the hell was going on. And everybody was very serious about art. I was serious about my art, but my art was not my friend's art. They still say, stayed friends with me. We still went to Mexico together. We still played poker, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I knew I'd never make the Ferris Gallery. They were all in the Ferris Gallery, the top gallery. You know, everybody going, well, Ferris Gallery is just, you know, made history. <laughs> you can't have a realistic painting with all this other stuff. It just doesn't go. Irving Blum, the director, director, is a very nice and very kind guy. He was a furniture salesman from Chicago with a Chicago accent. So he quickly developed a Cary Grant accent. <laughs> he went around town. He didn't have any money at all. He would pose in front of the most expensive cars he could see parked, right by it, has a picture taken, send it home. Hey, Mom, look how good I'm doing. <laughs> It was a great time. Um, all the painters, the groups, though, we just had a wonderful time. Uh, I cherish those times, and I cherish those days. They, they're all dead now, except for um, uh, Larry Bell. He was a sculptor. Sculptor. He puts together sheets of glass, basically, and coats them with big machinery and stuff. He shows internationally. He's a very big name still today. Um, Ed Ruscha, you all probably know who Ed Ruscha was. You know, the pictures that you can digest in 10 seconds. But that's what made his fortune. He was such a hit with every famous architect. He never took away from the building. You <laughs> got to see the painting, and you got it right away. And you said, oh, yeah, I got that. And then you went on your way. He came up with some really good stuff, though, and he continues to. And he's a very smart man, and he was dating the, most, the hottest starlets in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> he was also in a bunch of movies. Yeah, he got jobs, actually. He fooled around with the, uh, the Hollywood set. The Hollywood set is a part of the art. Billy Alabankson was going with Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, I never managed to go with anybody. <laughs> but then uh, I was not part of the cool school. If you're interested in that and how it all started, it is a feature film. You can get, you know, I'm sure it's somewhere around. Every time I want to see it again, it's like going to old, old home week and um, how things were. And uh, the great, I was so... Lucky. I have been the most lucky person in the world. After I came back to Venice, California, 
Billy Helvenson, another one of the people, he had he was motorcycle racing. He was in the hospital. He broke into the back. And so he said, well, why don't you stay in my apartment in Venice Beach? You know, and Venice Beach was slum by the sea. I mean, it was really. But big spaces for nothing. This is what starts an art movement, a place where artists have a place to paint and can live very cheaply. It's gone from Seattle now. It, it, you just can't do it anymore. And, Charles, could, uh, could, we, could I ask you about um, you know, James Terrell sure. and Irwin? Of course. And the light and space movement, particularly that connection with... Uh, yes. Um, this is a little bit after the cool school. Robert Irwin, um, let's see the one. This is, this is the one. This is a plexiglass kind of dome thing. It is held on the wall by what is black behind it. It comes out of the wall about this far. And there's like, you know, he has to put something on the wall to attach it to it. Uh, the only thing that you really see are the shadows from it. And that light, that, you know, the black in the middle that falls away to nothing, it's magic. It's absolute magic. It's an installation, a whole installation. I was at the Portland Art Museum, that was a few years ago. They had it in the basement. <laughs> they didn't even install it, they just hung it. It was the status thing I've ever seen. So I'm sure they, somebody has said something to them by now. Okay, so James Terrell came along. He lived in an old hotel, which is now a Starbucks. And um, he started by studying what happened with light at night when the lights came into his window. It was in the very basic part of the window shades. Just from this, how to deal things with light. You turn on the light bulb, what happens? You have the fluorescent light, you have LED, different kinds of light bulbs. This is his, his thing. He is a, basically playing with light, electricity. He makes the most amazing things. You probably know him from uh, opening up the sky in places. People's homes, they just have open space. Somewhere, you go outside and pat it or sit up, you look at it, see the sky go by. Sounds like nothing. It is magic. There's one uh, near the University of Washington, right near the art gallery there, that you can go and see. He, and then, of course, there's the Roden Crater, which is just one of the, well, as he says, it's never going to be complete in his lifetime. It's just too, too complex where he is capturing, capturing the stars and bringing down the colors of the different stars in these separate chambers. Uh, there's many things on YouTube that will explain the whole thing to you. I couldn't begin to tell you about it. But it is an actual crater with tunnels and chambers. And uh, he shows things in galleries. He sells things in order to finance this. Um, you can walk in the gallery and you will swear that there's something hanging on the wall that is absolutely solid as can be. Say like a mailbox, that size, just hanging on the wall. You get over there, it's nothing but light. He is he's a genius in his And uh, he, this came to him. He is basically a Quaker. And Quaker and light and uh, where they get together for their services is part of his life. Another really wonderful person. He and Robert Irwin were hired by the uh, people that send people off into space. NASA. NASA, yeah, okay. And they were doing a lot of um, experiments with them. One of them was uh, they were sort of wired up just a little bit, but the whole thing, all they had to do was go to sleep. And in this room that they were locked in, that was very solid, and next door was another very solid room full of objects. And their thing was to 
during the night, walk through the wall, go next door, and tell us in the morning what's in there. And they did. There's, the mind is a wonderful thing. And there's so many things possible that we know nothing about. So I'm sort of sad that I'm going to miss most of them at my age. You know, but uh, as part of that, um, I do psychic meditations regularly before I start painting because I want that extra thing, extra thing that makes it art. And I, if I have to be there and ground myself to go to the center of the earth, which is part of it, go through all your chakras, to the center of the universe, which is another part of it, call on spirit guides, all kinds of, any way I can do it, I will do it. And I find it a great help. It happens. Some days nothing happens. I had the hardest time coming across a spirit guide. Um, first of all, these big old Russian boyars, you know, like Alexander Gufnov, you know, that thing. And they weren't any help. There are people that you can ask questions. If you don't understand what's going on, you ask them questions. One of your chakras is underground, at least with the group I belong to, about 20 feet. However, we had a session where we were studying the moon, trying to get messages from actually the moon. What are you going to do with the moonlight? You can't bring the moon in anywhere. Well, what you did, you opened up your chakras. Of course, you're doing this all mentally, not physically. Putting in a hole in the ceiling, you're installing a reflecting pond to bring the moon down so you can talk to its reflection. Simple things like this. It sounds a little crazy, maybe, to some of you, but um, it's been a great help to me. And I think it's basically nothing but you're being your own psychiatrist. You're talking to yourself all the time, but you're talking to parts of you that you never generally get around to. What was popular very early on in LA painting too was the idea that if you are walking through a jungle, you're always going to have to be extra alert for tigers or something. But you know, for the danger, you wanted to develop that feeling while you were painting too. So you'd be more alert to what was happening on the canvas. There's all kinds of ways to paint, and believe me, it's much more interesting when you don't just put oils or, <laughs> or pastels or something on a sheet of paper. When you start getting into it, um, my painting, The Falling Angels and all that, is a result of that. I don't know. I've never seen a falling angel in my whole life. I never will. But I like the idea. You know, these are the people, these are the angels that when Adam and Eve were uh, expelled from the garden, Eve, they took pity on them. And they went down to help them, and God got mad at them. So he turned them all into stone. Uh, when they came back, they're so, you know, they started out as people, and the land on earth is rocks. I am in love with rocks. I have always been in love with rocks. I think rocks are personalities. I, I used to talk to rocks when I was a kid. <laughs> I had a very lonely child. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, when I was a child, it was World War II. And um, we live in Los Angeles, and we had uh, air, wage, air wage shelters and you know, blackouts and all that kind of stuff. And it was a little frightening. My mother was really mad at my father because he joined the military and he didn't have to because he had three kids. And uh, she, he left her with uh, me at six years old, my brother at four years old, and a babe in, babe in arms. And boy, was she mad. <laughs> and she kept yelling and yelling during the whole thing. So but we made up at the end. <laughs> so it all ended fine. Charles, could you transition to yes. the influence of 
Okay, this is yeah. a Jackson Pollock. Now, this is another, somebody else who's giving you another way of seeing. You don't just look, you don't look at it as a picture. It's not a picture of anything. It is a result of somebody walking or even dancing, moving in a specific rhythm around this painting. They're not even using a brush except to dip in paint, put the paint down, and the paints, you keep adding more, adding more, adding more, they'll mix. Still, you see, oh, this is what comes from living in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so you just, they all, it weaves together like this beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, first of all, you have to be able to read the color. There is a behind-the-surface color. There's an on-the-surface color, and there's a color that comes out in front of everything, visually. It doesn't do it physically. But you, your mind registers that. As uh, Terrell says, you put any color on a wall, and they're never on the same plane, same visual plane, ever. And that's the basis of his art, to play with that. And Pollock's was to go deep into him. He did a lot of uh, psychiatry work uh, at the same time. And Blue Poles, this particular painting, oh, no, we're now on. Um, go back to Blue Poles. Yeah, let's go back to Blue, yeah. blue Poles. It sat in his, his hallway for years without the Blue Poles. He couldn't figure out how, how to hold the damn thing together. It's so big. It's huge. So he went, you know, Cedar Bar was a hangout for abstract expressionists. They came back with him to the studio. They saw it in the hallway. Said, this looks interesting. He says, yeah, it's a mess. Nothing's working. And he says, well, I can't hold it together. I don't know. I can't get the rhythm from beginning to end. So one of them said, well, let's just, you got this lumber over here, let's just dip this one in blue paint and press it against the painting and see what happens. That's blue poles. It's sold for $2 million to the Australian government, which almost got them all kicked out. Of course, it's, to it's priceless today. It's probably a, a two made main Jackson Pollock with is probably the top poly, the most desirable of any of them. So don't just expect to see pictures. They're not in there. You expect to look at it, even as with all over, the more you look at it, the more you read the color. Now, my message today is, if you don't know how, learn how to read color. You have to. You absolutely must now. You didn't have to before. Joseph Albers, or before Hans Hoffman. Paintings were basically monochromatic. They figured out light and shade, basically, and then you sort of add the colors on. Now, anybody who knows anything about art reads the colors, where they are in space. Are they transparent? Are they translucent? Are they opaque? As Joseph Albers said, color is color only according to amount and placement. Per, in his color class, which would drive you crazy, it, I think it goes like, we did have one suicide. Uh, but it is really, it's just the most confusing class ever. He says, I want your darkest dark to be your brightest bright. What the hell does that mean? And any time you asked him a question, he would ask you another question to go along with that question. But his whole thing was, you develop you. You have nothing to do with him. If you ever made something like that, he would throw you out of class in two minutes. I mean, you know, you can't do squares with him. You have to be you. There was a guy who was the most god-awful painter. And he used to go around with a, a sharp knife in his pocket, like a mat knife. And he would see his paintings, and he would just slash it. And he, you know, would call it 
all kinds of names. This guy was painting dumb picture paintings. I mean, they didn't add up to anything. Finally, uh, he got tired of it. So he said, what I'm going to do is I am going to put canvas on a board. That old man's going to come by and try to do this. It's not going to happen. And he's going to be embarrassed, and I'm going to be happy. So what he did was, he did this, and on purpose, he made a really bad painting. And so Albert's walking through the class again. He looks at it. He goes, not so bad this time. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible dom. <laughs> anyway, but what really saved the painting, trying to make it bad, was much better than him trying to be a lousy second-rate painter. At least it had some originality. And I've tried to do that forever. You know, I, I, that, that's been my model and my creed. And so that... that okay, so yeah. now we're on to... This is the Bonard. Uh, these colors sure don't come, don't look like anything in here. But uh, Bonard has... Maybe we could dim the lights so people could see the yeah, colors let's better. Yeah, take off the lights and see if we can't get some color out of these things. Cole? Y'all talk in the dark. <laughs> Just don't light a cigarette. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it just not those colors. Now they're starting to there be. See the colors now? Yeah. Okay, read those colors. Notice how this painting is absolutely flat. The colors make it flat. It's absolutely dimensional at the same time. You can read these colors differently in your mind if you wish to. What happens with that purple? Look at that beautiful purple. It's not just purple, it's mixed with other colors, and you can see the other colors in it as it's mixed. You know, you, can, you have all ways of choosing how to read this painting. It is a living thing. This is what everybody in Los Angeles was trying for, everybody in San Francisco, a living thing. A painting is something that is living and alive not just another beautiful exercise of your skill. Oh boy, I'm really on the bandstand today. <laughs> okay, but I just, I'm amazed by Pollock, just amazed. And the one that, um, who's the guy that had all the money that died and they had the big auction here? I don't know. Paul, yeah, Paul, yeah, Paul Allen. He had the most amazing Pollock still life. Uh, it's, part of, it's part in the catalog. It's a huge still life. It was one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen in my life. Whoever his sister hired to put together a collection did a wonderful job. Did you mean Bonard? Uh, yes, we're through with this Bonard. Okay. Let's look to the next one. Well, what ever happened to that? We had two more, aren't we? Yeah, we did this one and this one. Okay, which one did we show? We showed both. Oh, we showed both. Yeah. Okay, well, I can't tell from here. Move on to the Ken Price. Yeah. This is Ken Price, who was a very good friend of mine. Uh, we shared a house for a few years. Uh, we were almost uh, kicked out of USC at the same time. <laughs> USC, I, I got to admit, I mean, what I learned there was very valuable. It was... I might as well have been in a, a Venetian uh, studio learning from an old master. Uh, I learned all kinds of tricks and things. This, it was Francis D'Ertley, who was a brilliant painter. He had, went around scaring everybody. He was a very big man and a very imposing man. And uh, he sort of bullied you in an indirect manner. And you're quite, you know, you paid very attention to him. You certainly never crossed him. But he knew all these wonderful techniques. And you know, everything comes down to really the knowledge. The right br brush, the right medium, that is what you're mixing the paint with. How much oil, 
or how much turpentine or how much varnish. Oil turpentine varnish is the classical formula that you mix with the oil paints and oil. What is the surface like? He could paint a perfect egg in five seconds. The secret is, if you have a colored background, you paint the egg the color of the shadow, solid, while it's still wet. You take the right brush, you add white to it, you start in the middle, and you move it, and you move it around, and then you're at the edge, and it all joins together. It just flows with the right kind of oil. And you have a perfect egg in 10 seconds. <laughs> you know, and painting hair, it's the right brush. How you put it on the last, you know, all these tricks you see that look like it's magic, it looks just like this. It's all doable. It's, it's a technique, which is not art. It's a good copy of reality, but it's not art. Okay, what's oh so Ken Price is using color too, only this is a surface that is shiny. So the color is reflected into the other colors. He is playing with the colors and all of a sudden, now start looking at this. And you can't even see it. Anyway, it isn't gonna work with, with these lights. And, but something that's actually coming forward, if you look at the color, will go back and something that is going back will come forward with a color. Because he's having you read color and not paying attention to the structure. It's an incidental thing for, for you to read the color. Okay. Clifford Still. Yes, now we're onto Clifford Still. Clifford Still is my mentor. I never met him in my whole life. He has been at my, on my shoulder every time I start painting a painting. He is the tyrant of San Francisco. Every, he had everybody trembling when he was teaching there. He, another one, was you know, the wrath of God guy. My God, he changed. He was the first person to make a non-European painting. We were busy making Cezannes and this so-and-so and so-and-so so that looks so like so-and-so. He said, no, it's time for American painting by Americans to move into a new direction. And that's exactly what he did. He is the guy that really got abstract expression into a new direction. He believed paintings should be at least seven feet tall so you could walk into them visually. Um, I also had a, a, a psychokinetic thing that one of his paintings at the Museum of Modern Art. I, I, turned the corner and there was a black painting and all of a sudden I was being pulled into it. It just, just like that. And I almost fell into the canvas. Um, he just, paintings are amazing. He mixed his own colors. He didn't have a, just buy it. He mixed it. He knew exactly how they should go on, how thick, how thin, how granular. He didn't use a brush. He used palette knives. They're really sort of just, you know, really just plastered on beautifully. And I hope you'll go see the Clifford Still Museum in Denver if you have not. That is my favorite place in the world right now. They keep changing shows too. They own everything that he ever did that he didn't sell. So he got so tired of New York he left New York, he called the Museum of Modern Art the gas chamber where paintings go to die. <laughs> he hated curators, he, with very few exceptions. He hated people, he hated dealers, he hated everybody. He didn't go on with <laughs> but if you wanted to buy a painting from him, you had to go to an interview if you were worthy of this painting. <laughs> and he believed that paintings actually had the power of good and evil and life and death. And I am not kidding you, he really believed that. And there are some paintings that will put you in a different world. They are absolutely, if you give them a chance, let them speak to you. It's another thing that's contemporary painting. It's not 
but it's not your father's painting anymore. <laughs> However that old ad goes. Okay. Let's move on to Al. Okay. Well, boy, we have skipped all over the place. Um, this is a Joseph Albers. Joseph Albers also did not use the brush. He used a uh, mat knife. He wanted to get rid of the art of the person who put it on. The idea was for you to see color, and pure color has color interacts with other colors. Now, simple as that. Color is only color according to amount and placement. Here is a demonstration of that. How? Okay. Not good in this one. It's not showing up. Better in this one. Okay. Notice that the, nothing's in the middle. Down at the bottom, you see yellow. Yellow's yellow. But look, the gray is a different shade of gray. It's darker. It's lighter when it's at the top because more gray makes it lighter, less gray makes it darker. You're getting into this kind of sensitivity now. OK. And then we had this halo of blue, which is just about the same value. It just it's hovering like a ghost around it. And it's more easy to see in some places than it is in other places. And the background color itself changes according to the mountain placement. The bottom parts are all different than the sides than the top. Now, next time you see a Joseph Alvarez, every time I saw Joseph Alvarez when I was a kid in art school, you know, um, high school, uh, there used to be a Joseph Alvarez there that was hanging on the wall, and people would always scratch it up. They, it made them furious to see that because they had no idea what it was. They just thought, you know, somebody has really put wool over somebody's eye. You know, here somebody just painted these squares and there's nothing at all and probably paid a thousand dollars for it or something. But I've never seen that painting in decent shape. They kept repairing it. Every color in there is straight from a tube of paint. And he writes on the back of the painting, Windsor Newton, bright yellow, Windsor Newton, you know, yellow orange, yep, Windsor Newton, whatever they make the title. I have known painters who, Irving Blum had a painting of this show, a show of these paintings. Billy Al went there and he copied the formulas on every one. <laughs> he made paintings using those colors. It had nothing to do with squares. But they sure look good. The colors really interacted quite beautifully. So um, that's a nice shortcut. <laughs> OK, this is one of my very early paintings. Uh, not, no, not that early, maybe six years, six, seven years ago. It's called uh, Listen to the Crows. And uh, every, one of, every painting I do, I am solving a problem. They're just not nothing. They're just not the picture I tell you it is. It's solving a painter problem. This is what excites me. I got this idea when I saw a show at, of Cezanne's at the Barnes Collection. I took a group of people there. We spent three days in the old house before they put it in the in now really beautiful galleries. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, why is this painting so screwy looking? Why is there still life with the oranges in the foreground, and there's a big orange in the background, and it's just this big orange circle? And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, he's not making pictures. He's solving paintings. He's solving problems. He'll take the most difficult things. You know, if you had a road, and you're sitting, standing in the middle of it, how you paint it so right here is here and goes back? He'll tackle problems like that. And that's why they're so interesting. He was also the first painter to model with color rather than tone. He used pure color. Now, of course, people did in business, you know, all this stuff. But there's a major art movement. The first, color to, first painter to model with color. 
You don't just put shadows on it anymore. No more grays. Shadows are never just gray unless it's a shadow of something that is gray. They're always a different kind of color, right? He was the one that also figured out how to paint on the surface, behind the surface, in front of the surface. He's the guy who changed art forever. And then along came Cubism, and they did something else. It's a continual movement. Abstract expression was the last major thing to change painting. It's a living, growing thing. It's not dead. It's not corpses on the wall. It's something that is really exciting. So what problem were you trying to solve with Listen to Crows? Okay, first of all, I had this, uh, it's almost the raw canvas in the middle of that pinkish thing. It's not those colors. It's, there's a purple cast to it that is not there. Uh, the top of the painting, um, I was trying to make really loud noises like um, you'd look at it and maybe you would reverberate a little bit and think of a crow's sound. So that's why the title is Crows. Then I wanted to animate the movement of crows as they move and hop around. That's a little purple things all around. It animates the surface so it's not just sitting there. It's going boop, 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 boop. <coughs> up here in my mind. <laughs> what, what's doing in your mind is something, maybe something else. But uh, and then I was playing with drips, and you, as you can see on the left hand side really very long drips, and I was feeling very adventurous. And then I wanted a full moon up there, and the only color that worked right for the right kind of space of going way back into the sky was this color of green, which I, that moon is made of green cheese, by the way. <laughs> so, and then the lines are telling you the trajectory of crow flying, flying trying to get that in there a little bit, so there's a reason behind all that. Abstraction has a reason. And most every abstract painting does. It's just not making a bunch of stuff. Did we ever see a de Kooning? Um, we went past that because we were talking about oh, color. OK. Yeah. Well, he's the person who does uh, things with lines and stuff that it looks like a painting, and it looks like it's just stuff. But boy, you read those things. Oh my God, his paintings are impossible. They're impossible. The texture, the surface, the meaning. And he worked months and months on every painting to get it just right. A kind of internal balance of everything being just right. As a painter, when it's working, you hear that click. You finish that one thing. And and you know it's finished. If you don't hear, hear that click, it's not there. It's not finished. I know we opened with your... Um, okay. Oh, um, here. Is this Venice, Italy or Venice, California? This is Venice, Italy. Yeah. Venice through yeah. memories. This yeah. is my big problem painting. The person who owns it, I ran the first time in years. There she is over there. And uh, I was looking at this. And I thought, oh, my God, I wish I had, still had this painting. I really like it. This is all about transparent, translucent, opaque. The quality of the colors. How far can you see through them? You see through transparency very easily. Translucent is the kind of foggy thing that's on showers, you know, shower doors or glass. And opaque, you can't see through at all. So I was having problems with this painting quite a few problems, and I decided to go for that. And this is the first time I've ever used lines from the top to bottom that are just lines to the top to the bottom. But um, they are doing something in this. Anytime you have a line coming through like that, it's usually sitting on the surface. We're also trying to make that line go back. We, it's on top of some colors there. It is going back. So I was basically playing with this painting to learn something, and I was very fond of the conclusion. In fact, I still am. Okay. Angels. Yeah, this is from my, my, the, last, the show before last. I 
everyone was, is using this color now. This color just came out recently, a few years ago. It was never available before. Every painting in the world, you know, every painting has one of these. Blue, I'm so sick of this. Blue. So I decided, okay, Charles, you're going to have to use it, and you're going to have to use it, and you're going to have to use it till you like it. <laughs> so um, it started out actually being horizontal rather than vertical, and it started out as a landscape, which did not work at all. So I said, okay, on this, you're going to be a really picky painter, like you learned when you were in school. So, see this thing down at the bottom? You can't see it from here. Right? It just, but those lines tie it, they bind it, they're separate, they go back, they come forward. The lines describe shapes on top of shapes that are already there through color, but yet they're still working with it. The little pieces of color throughout are in different spaces, according to the background color. That big, I just really enjoyed painting this painting. It, I, I can remember sitting there just having the best time. These things on the right, they were, those were the mountains of the sideways one. And then I had to have something really bring it up there in the corner that, no. I have to tell you, there's no such thing as good reproduction. There's, it doesn't exist. These colors are not right. There's not as many colors as I put in. You just don't. You know, it doesn't really happen. And uh, notice the different colors, vertical lines. Each one is in a different space according to its color. If you're reading the color, this is going back, this one's coming forward. Picture them. Let them move in space. It's not just being lines on top. Start, begin to read the depth within the painting. Now, I'm not one to make things necessarily flat all the time. Uh, I don't really follow that idea. I just want my kind of space. I want it to have, have it to really take care of the entire surface. This is another thing that's happened since abstract expressionism says on. You are responsible for the entire surface. I had in one of my classes, we had a Cezanne that I, I, I pass out reproductions instead of showing slides because today the color reproductions are really pretty good and they're closer than you know any kind of slides can ever be. I um, I was really concerned uh, with the idea of having something that was going to work in a particular, particular way. So I made everybody come in with a white canvas, certain dimensions, and then I passed out this reproduction. And this reproduction was a big shape that Cezanne had painted. And then he left all this white. No one, no one left the white. They all put this thing in the middle. This is idiotic. I mean, he is, he's showing you how to activate a neutral color into doing all kinds of things, all kinds of magic in his paintings. That's the whole point of it. And it was my whole point to them, says you hadn't paid any attention at all. Because this is there, like there for a reason. And then I went on to explain the reason. So you weren't even seeing. You were looking, but you weren't seeing. You must learn how to see. Can you speak to the Big Sur painting? Oh, this, yeah, this is a Big Sur a miracle. I, um, it, it's quite large, actually. This is the first time I ever put stars in the painting which I thought was really corny, but it sure works. <laughs> it fall, falls apart without the stars. Um, I met somebody, we looked at each other, we said, oh my God, we got to go on a trip. We went to Big Sur. <laughs> we were, uh, stayed there a few days, took a few drugs. Um, <laughs> then it's time to come home. It's the end of the season. Nobody was there, all the kids, uh, the camp people, 
campground was almost deserted. And there's a place where the river that goes through Big Sur meets the ocean that meets the sea. And right there, these big sand dunes, they're dry and some are wet. So it was a full moon night, so we're lying on our back, looking up at the full moon. There's no cloud in the sky. It was absolutely perfectly empty. Warm summer night. All of a sudden, this breeze came up. These clouds came in. They went on top of the moon. They went around to the other side. They went under the moon and went out again. I swear it happened. I can see the movement. I can we see both the movement. swear it happened. You know, we were just amazed. And we weren't on drugs. <laughs> we had a little bit of, just a little smoke early in the morning. And nothing since. Except we went hiking and the drugs were off that day. <laughs> and then you had to walk all this way back instead of float back. <laughs> So we were really tired, but, but we both saw it at the same time. And in my mind, in my eye, it, it happened. I don't know if it can happen or not, but it, I'll swear it did to me. OK, this is, um, actually, I'm cheating with this one. And I never told my dealer, um, the dealer, uh, was uh, John Sisko uh, before my present dealer. Who I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm very lucky to have my present dealer. He is wonderful. John Sisko was too. But John Sisko, I told him, you know, John, I want these pale things to look like they're going back. They're the only things that are solid color, the pale yellows. I want them to be so different, they'll look like they're holes in the painting. So he painted one wall exactly that yellow. And we put this painting on top of it, and boy, it looked like big rats had been in chow chewing on this painting. It, it was so nice, and what a wonderful thing to do for me. I mean, I just, oh, I love that guy. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But what a wonderful man. At his funeral, I have never seen so many people. You might as well have been at a, you know, at a, Seahawk game. There were that many people there. So low. That's a wonderful person. Anyway, and this is a painting. Now, what is that big oval thing? That is, okay. I was reading somebody else. I forget. It was a woman artist, a uh, writer who I really liked. And I was reading um, also The Snow Leopard. Do you know that? Peter Matheson? Peter Matheson. There's a little sentence in there that's saying, that tells you, if you are meditating properly, rocks will begin to dance. That's what this painting is all about, the big dancing rock. And the colors don't show. There's kind of a Hudson School kind of painting in, right next to the rock at the top where you see those bright colors that isn't showing on this. This is an art gallery now. Yeah. Excuse me? I think this is an art gallery it's now. Oh, well, that you can see people it. It's can upstairs. Walk out. Okay. Yeah, for the reception. Well, it's, I'm telling you what it's all about. Uh, yeah, well, these are actually waves of kind of energy moving through it. Something else I'm trying to get. I hope people read it that way. I don't know if they, some people do, some people don't. It also changes the space. I like this the top extremely well, and that big lavender thing, its position in relation to the space of everything else, I think is really good. So I'm very pleased with it, and um, actually it sold a couple times, and a couple of people took it home. They had no room for it. <laughs> they had to bring it back. It's in somebody's bedroom now, which <laughs> looks very nice. Okay, this... Uh, they, there's something they hand out here, too, and this, the top part of this is, is on that. This Our was, exhibition guide. Huh? Our exhibition guide. Your exhibition guide, right. This was a painting that all the purple had already been painted in. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, you know, I just want to make this painting. And I 
this was probably finished in 40 minutes. The entire thing. And I also did a lot. Of, see those lines? I put the lines on a separate piece of tracing paper and I smashed them against the surface. It's why they're unusual and different shapes and sizes. So they're really activated and um, I like the colors because they're really hot and they're they're hard colors to work with. That was another challenge. Um, I like the moon because the moon is not one color, it's many colors. And uh, this is most everybody's favorite painting who's seen it in person. And it's only about this big. Uh, Jean Evans on it. She's here today. Lucky Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and this, yeah, this is from my last show. This is one of the dancing rocks going, this is my meditation piece. As you can see, uh, you can't really see very well. No, there is, is this in the show? I think it is, yeah. Okay, pay attention to the area down left and the sky up above. There's a lot more than that's in this one right now. And that red was like um, a gash or a wound, like a human wound. Uh, it's one of the last angels you know, landing on Earth. There you go. And there's a few in the background. And I just really enjoyed painting rocks. I love painting rocks. I just, because the format is such a wonderful format. And you can play with it. And you can do things with it. It's like you know, it's like a cook in the kitchen. You've got all these, you want to make cookies. Why? Well, you got all kinds of cookies to make. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, this one. Yeah, this was also a, a field of angels. But, oh, angelic vista. This is actually very thick paint. It doesn't show in this photograph, but it's the first time I really tried to have really thick paint and to manipulate the paint where the brush strokes actually give a little extra activity because you see the shadows and the difference in that. So you can have basically, you, it's kind of also, I'm looking at Bonard, his handling of how to paint a background. Uh, and then all these vertical lines, they, in, is this here? I'm in, not sure. In the I show? No. I guess not. Well, anyway. Uh, the colors tell you how close they are to the surface. The colors tell you how far back they are. So they're not just here, they're here, here. And they also, different kinds of things are happening and the things are marked off by the lines. Well, thank you so much, Charles. I'd love to open this up to just a few minutes of questions from the audience. Sure. Sound yeah. good? Hey, okay. anybody has a question, I'll bring you the mic. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, you said that Clifford Still, um, I think it was Clifford Still, believed that paintings had the power of good and evil in them. Do you believe that, or what? No. No. <laughs> what do you think? I'm not a magician, <laughs> and I don't believe in that. I mean, I just, I, I think it was all over the top, you know, and um, one thing I do believe is don't ever put a frame around your painting. It's like you're imprisoning a painting. It doesn't let them expand. You put them in a little cell. If you must have a frame, make sure it's a moat frame, which means if the wood does not meet the painting, there's an open space between that. That's OK. I'll go along with that. But <laughs> that uptight, no. Yeah. I have a question about four paintings. <clears throat> Four paintings that you have in the show. Okay. And those four paintings will have a window or two yeah. in oh. them. Can you talk about those? Yeah, that was an earlier period that I wanted to show you. Sometimes exactly the same scene and how it looked in different seasons. That was the basic idea. Uh, and then it went on to be, how can I change the color to change the format you know, and expand? But 
basically at least one of the windows will give you a clue to what it would look like in winter when we have summer, the rest of the painting is summer. That was the idea. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. How much, do, when you're painting, how much of it is like you have a, an idea in your head and how much of it is improvised, if that's, uh, you can answer that question. Okay, always, every painting starts with an idea, but it keeps on changing. Every painting is probably 30 or 40 paintings before I quit. Because this, why don't I try this? I tell my students, well, I don't teach anymore, but anyway, I used to tell my students, if you think about it, do it, try it, you're going to learn something. You know, you're not going to know until you do it. So do it and see what happens. And I followed that pretty much all through. Because there's such a thing as a happy accident. Who's that guy that said that with the big hair? Bob Ross. Yeah, Bob Ross. No, happy, happy little rocks. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, yeah, you know, painting is a creative process. If I knew what it was going to look like before I finished it, it would be a craft. Because there's no intuition, there's no creativity. I have this picture of exactly what it's supposed to be, and I'm going to copy it. What's the fun in doing that? I want to enjoy it. I want to learn something. I want to get excited. Yes. Uh, oh. um, you mentioned that each painting is like a problem for you, and I guess I wondered if you could talk more about that. Like, what kind of problems are they? Are they sort of like okay, existential uh, or craft, like technique? Or? Uh, no, not so much technique, but composition is one. I uh, I'm. Every time I learn something, I keep yelling. Well, I don't have students anymore. I have critique groups. People paint independently, and they bring them, and we look at them, and we talk about them. And recently, I'm on a bandwagon about structure. Um, if any of you went up to San Francisco to see the Big Bone Art Exhibition, you were very lucky. I mean, I learned so much from that thing. That was just a knockout. Oh my God, it was beautiful. And what I learned there, his structure, his color structure, quite often is third, 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 third top, third in the middle, third in the bottom. And what he does is he'll pick three basic colors, sky, blue, uh, green, maybe sand, yellow, something at the bottom. But he makes sure that each one of those thirds has the other two color in it somewhere. That way, you have a painting that holds it together automatically. That's a very smart idea. You know, and if a painting isn't working, you might try that. <laughs> you know, and then, oh, just, yeah, it's that kind of problem. And I will, on purpose, there's a painting, every time I have a show, there's a painting I absolutely love that everybody else hates. No one ever buys. It's because it was the biggest problem that I solved. <laughs> and uh, Sarah Harvey has one right now back in the room. And, you know, in the back room, no one at least been interested. But that problem was for me to figure out how to have a, there's a lot of sky in the middle and there's a lot of things around the the edges of rocks floating and stuff like that. How to make that sky come right up to the surface and be as strong as the back, and how the rocks are going to help this, and how are the rocks in relationship to the edges, you know, just all kinds of painterly things that you think about. And thick paint versus thin paint. All kinds of things like that. You know, what every painting suggests its own things. And I, you know, I recently saw a, uh, a show of paintings that were just like, if there was a guidebook, say, here are the basic formats, the basic formulas for making 
a painting of landscapes? They were all there. Now, the very obvious ones. And they're still obvious. Nothing's happening. So the whole idea is to take something like that and turn it into something that's unexpected, that nobody would think about. The idea is to move things forward, move myself forward. I'm not going to move art forward. I'm no Cezanne. I'm no Pollock. I'm no... No, I have no talent. I had no talent. When I started, when I started, I started in set design. I was in love with Russian ballerina and ballet and all that kind of stuff. So I was going to make sets and costumes. I started with that. I read that the very best set in the whole world was designed Picasso by Picasso. So I thought, well, you better learn how to paint. <laughs> started painting and never turned around since. So, um, and believe me, I, I'm no you know, prima donna. I just can't do it like that. Every once in a while, I'll be lucky. <laughs> I'll put another brush stroke. There's, there's one in, in the show, too. In, uh, um, it's a white line on the yellow background. You might work, work with it, look for it. That white line was the luckiest line I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> that painting was not hanging together. Nothing was happening. I said, well, what would happen if I... Yeah, and I love it now. Okay. Thank you so much, Charles. You're it's more been than wonderful. Welcome.